Good morning and welcome to the service of worship with the Princeton University Chapel community. My name is Teresa Timms and I serve as the Associate Dean of Religious Life in the Chapel here at Princeton University. Today is the fifth Sunday of Eastertide, May 10th, 2020. From wherever you are watching, we give thanks for you and we are so glad that you have joined us. Again, welcome. Hear now this call to worship. Come, take refuge in God. God who listens when we cry, who rescues us when we call, who leads us and guides us with unfailing love. Let us worship together. Today is Student Recognition Sunday in the life of the chapel community, when we celebrate and recognize outstanding students. Our first award will go to the Kenneth Christopher Harris 65 Memorial Award, which remembers a wonderful alumnus from the class of 1965 who served as a chapel deacon. The award goes annually to those graduating seniors who have done the most to promote religious life on campus. This year's award recipients are Tally Ansville, Emma Coley, Sarad Hassan, and Peter Schmidt. The Sonia Rudikoff Gutman Chapel Choir Award recognizes choir leadership. This year's award recipients are Alex Cox, McGinnis Miller, Tajin Rogers, Alexandra Wilson. We would like to also give thanks and recognize our chapel seminarian, Jenna Reed, who is a rising senior at Princeton Theological Seminary. The 2020 Reverend Dr. Joseph C. Williamson Sermon Competition Award recipient is Jonathan Ort, and he will be delivering today's sermon. We have one chapel deacon graduating this year, Alex Entz, who will receive his MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School and we celebrate our graduating seniors and graduate students in the chapel choir. Rose Abatir, Glenda Chen, Alexander Cox, Anna Dung, Shannon Fitzgerald, Rachel Emmons, Madeline Cushion, McGinnis Miller, Tajin Rogers, Alexandra Wilson, and Dylan Morris. Son of God. 
Hi everyone. I'm uh, incredibly excited and, and grateful to be able to join you for this service today. Um, and, and so to get started, I'll share the reading that we have before delving into the sermon. Thank you so much. Today's reading comes from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. Then he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had changed the water into wine. Now there was a royal official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my little boy dies. Jesus said to him, Go. Your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. As he was going down, his slaves met him and told him that his child was alive. So he asked them the hour when he began to recover. And they told them, they said to him, Yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. The father realized that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he himself believed, along with his whole household. Now this was the second sign that Jesus did after coming from Judea to Galilee. The word of the Lord. Why would Jesus hesitate to save a child on the verge of death? In today's passage, a royal official from Capernaum seeks Jesus in the hope he can heal his dying son. And though we might expect Jesus to intercede without second thought, he first rebukes the seeker, suspecting that the man's faith is insincere. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe, Jesus scolds. Jesus' sharp words reverberate today, when the image of that anguished father and ailing son strike especially close to home. Across the globe, more than 250,000 people have perished from the coronavirus. Millions more have suffered infection and illness, and billions have endured isolation and fear. In the Fellowship of the World, an essay submitted to the 1960s CBS radio program This I Believe, the screenwriter Neven Bush asked, How does one think in the crowded city that is life? My basic belief about this, he continued, is that I don't like to ride in taxi cabs. Rather than pay a fare to sit alone, Bush prefer preferred to take the subway. Indeed, beneath the city's choked avenues, Bush found, quote, our comrades, our fellow wayfarers, riding in a taxi cab, one lacks of company. In the subway, he wrote, quote, you're not alone. You get on the train, people bang into you, the train buckles and rolls, and the air is bad. It doesn't smell good. But life is going on there, and life doesn't smell good either. Yet somehow, it's wonderful. For Bush, faith entailed seeking out other people. Not those who look or behave like ourselves, but rather those with whom we share little in common. Just as Bush longed to descend to the subway, to be with and among his fellow passengers, so too does Jesus dwell there, just as the subway brings together an incredible array of people. Christ accompanied human beings from all walks of life, even, especially, the destitute, the lonely, the despairing. And in the story that John tells today, the seeker comes to recognize his own place within that subway. After Jesus' rebuke, he simply entreats, Sir, come down before my little boy dies. In enjoining Jesus to save his son, the seeker casts aside his earthly title. He addresses Jesus with the Greek word kyrios, translated here as sir, but elsewhere in Matthew and in Luke as lord. He stands before Jesus not as a royal official, but rather as the father of a dying son, 
who beseeches Jesus to come down to where he is. And in so doing, he reveals his faith to be genuine. Jesus tells him, go, your son will live. Bush saw writing on the subway as a philosophy for life. Quote, the way I make the trip then can be my faith, he wrote. Words don't count. It's what I do and how I like to travel. When I pray, I can lock the door of an office and pray by myself. That's like riding in a cab. Or I can go to a church. I can pray in a temple or a cathedral where thousands of people pass in and out every day. They are all praying too. They are taking the same ride I am. And in mingling my prayers with them, I join the fellowship of the world in humility before the mysteries that surround the journey. I think that is the way to take the ride. Yet today, that ride is closed to us. I first drafted this survey last year, long before anyone had ever heard of COVID. A year later, the act of riding on a subway, much less congregating in a church, a temple, or a cathedral, has become unthinkable, and rightly so. To protect ourselves and those around us, we keep our distance. There's no telling when our routines, when our interactions with one another, when our crowded commutes on the subway might return to normal. Even more troubling, the common human experience represented by riding on the subway does not reflect how this pandemic has unfolded. We know all too well of the staggering racial and socioeconomic disparities in the toll the virus has taken. To declare we're all in this together risks obscuring the structural racism that predisposes certain communities to the virus. Rather than being a great equalizer, the virus has laid bare foundational injustices in American society. What sense then is there in comparing faith to a crowded subway when our lives are so starkly different? Today's text, I believe, presents a similar quandary. Though the seeker humbles himself before Christ, his life is not in keeping with his faith. The seeker belongs to Capernaum's imperial administration. He is wealthy, for he can take leave of his home and travel to Cana. Matthew recounts a nearly identical story, in which Jesus miraculously heals the son of a Roman centurion who professes his faith in the Son of God. According to some accounts, the centurion and the royal official are one and the same. In any case, the seeker in John's account upholds the imperial power that would one day put Jesus to death. And though he briefly submits to Christ, though he briefly sees himself on the subway, the seeker unrepentantly returns to his position of dominance. On his way home, he encounters his slaves, who bring him news of his son's miraculous recovery. The seeker, we learn, enslaves other, other women and men. The passage holds up a slave-owning, imperial officeholder is one of Jesus' first acolytes. Indeed, we learn that after the seeker adopts Christianity, quote, his whole household converts. Presuming John counted them among the household, the seeker's slaves, much less his own family, became Christian when their master did. There was no epiphany, no miracle, no revelation. Instead, there was the religion their master chose for them. And despite professing his faith in Christ's universal fellowship, despite claiming to join his fellow wayfarers aboard the subway, the seeker continues to subjugate others. The fact that Jesus intervened to save a child, a son who could not be held responsible for his father's shortcomings, does not excuse the seeker's hypocrisy. In his rendering of the story, John emphasizes the miracle or the son's healing as, quote, the second sign that Jesus did after coming from Judea to Galilee. Jesus' miracle is intended to reveal his divine prowess to the adults, not the ill child. 
And though Jesus scolds the seeker for only believing when he sees signs and wonders, Jesus here provides him with just such a spectacle in his son's miraculous recovery. If our faith is to mean something, we can't just preach platitudes that we don't bear out in our own lives. Bush reminds us, quote, words don't count. It's, no, it's what I do and how I like to travel. Yet even Bush's analogy has its limitation. Riding on the subway doesn't necessarily mean we practice what we preach. On the subway, how many times have we turned our gaze away from somebody because of the way they looked? How often have we shrunk away, shrank away from someone who asked for money? I know I have too many times to count. How we travel, how we like to travel then, is only half the equation. The other half is how we treat the people we encounter along the way. And that's what today's passage teaches us. Even in a person as troubled as the seeker, Jesus sees the prospect, the possibility of redemption. The seeker remains as sinful as he was before, as he always was. That doesn't change. But for just a moment, he relinquishes his earthly trappings. He comes to Jesus as nothing more than human. And in that transcendent moment, John affords us a glimpse of Jesus' true potential, the promise of collapsing all oppression and all hierarchy. For an instant, Jesus and the man who seeks his help are passengers on the, summit, on the same subway, prefiguring what is to come for all of us. Amen. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Dear God, we give thanks to you and praise to you for this day, a day full of your grace and mercy. We pray that you would grant us peace and give us the perspective to see you as we move throughout our days. May we see you in those we greet, in the strangers on the street, and, then, and in the reflection we see in the mirror. May we, we be reminded that we are indeed your children and we are deeply loved. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Because of your love and care for us, we lift up burdens that are too heavy for us to carry. We pray for Anne's mother and all people who are in nursing homes. Dear God, be with them and their caregivers. We pray for those who are ill, including our friends, Marianne, Pete, and Sohaib. We also give thanks for healing and recovery, Lilia and Jackie. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We also pray. We pray for those who are on the margins of the margins, those without homes, the food insecure, children in foster care, widows, the addicted, and those overwhelmed by grief, loss, sorrow, and more grief. As we enter a new month, we are ever more mindful of the financial strain for the basic necessities. God, let your people serve and give with generous hearts. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, in a world full of hurt and pain, we pray that you be with us, lead us and guide us to do your will. In surrendering our will, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us continue with our prayer for Princeton. O eternal God, the source of life and light for all peoples, we pray you would endow this university with your grace and wisdom. 
Give inspiration and understanding to those who teach and to those who learn. Grant vision to its trustees and administrators. To all who work here and to all who bear her name, give your guiding spirit of sacrificial courage and loving service. Amen. Now to God, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to God be glory forever and ever. Amen.